We're here at the John Godwin Family Cemetery on the western shore of the Chattahoochee River to talk about the master of Horace King. Since his death, King has become a famous example of the Southland's attempt to paint slavery in a somewhat sympathetic light. Godwin was born in South Carolina in 1798 and by most accounts took a very progressive attitude towards his slaves, if that can even be said. One of his slaves, Horace, was said to be half Catawba, but may have been half white. The origin of many a southern family legend having some Indian blood often lies in slave masters having children with their slaves. In any case, Godwin, a master architect and bridge builder, noticed a great deal of potential in Horace, and so began an apprenticeship. Throughout the 1830s and 40s, Godwin and King partnered in construction projects around Columbus, and in 1846 he purchased his freedom from the Godwin family. This is often retold the claim that John Godwin freed him after his apprenticeship was over, but in reality, Godwin had no legal mandate to sell him his freedom, and did anyway. Whatever the case, King continued building bridges and buildings around the South, including the beautiful stairs at the Alabama State Capitol, and in 1852 he purchased land close to John's plantation and when he died in 1859, he erected this marker. But I do want to say a little something about the social dynamic of slavery here in Columbus that can't necessarily be said anywhere else. And I also want to point out the carving on the tombstone. This stone was placed here by Horace King and lasting remembrance of the love and gratitude he felt for his lost friend and former master. Said simply, slave owners here were much more liberal about mixing with their slaves. In fact, when Indian agents arrived to what is now Columbus, years before Godwin ever settled here, they were astounded to find a community which they derisively named Sodom, composed of freed slaves, Indians, Scottish fur trappers, and adventure seekers. It's reasonable to assume that the prospect of living with a mixed community might have at least played a small part in John Godwin's decision to move here. King became famous in the Deep South, a fame which he still has to this day. He purchased his own slave, J. Sella Martin, whom he attempted to whip into submission. Martin would later be sold by Horace King, disappointed in his resistant attitude, and would soon escape and become an abolitionist. Horace King became an Alabama state representative, and a perfect example of the complexity of social issues facing the antebellum South. Next to a replica of one of the bridges he constructed at the Mulberry Street Cemetery is the grave of Horace King. But before I get to show you that, I'd like to show you other graves which are around here. Like many Confederate cemeteries, this was buried on the opposite side of the railroad tracks in a historically black cemetery. In fact, in the view that we panned across, there are about 425 graves of slaves and freedmen whose names are now lost to history. And here in the Confederate cemetery, during the Battle of Atlanta, they would be transported ported down on rail, and they would be brought here, where many of them would die. In this cemetery, you have people from 13 different states, all Confederate soldiers. And as we pan around here, we can see this was once the black cemetery. Slaves, freed persons of color, even just incredibly poor people would be buried here. In fact, if you take a look at this part of the cemetery, there are eight graves which are unmarked, and there are two slabs, but no markings on them there. These are believed to have been orderlies at the Confederate hospitals, and they were very likely slaves. Uh, of course, they would not have been given regular graves, but a lot of this stems back to traditions during slavery. Oftentimes, they would insist on having these funerals at night with the master's permission, because of course, everything had to be done with his permission, but the stated aim, or the, the understood aim, was Basically, if you did this at night, you'd be able to sneak out if you were on a neighboring plantation to attend the funeral. And this was kind of a show of solidarity that the slaves would do. They would uh, basically come from miles around to see every time one of them died, and they would sing. And a lot of the white people kind of understood that this was a time for the slaves. And they would let them have their own funerals here on the outskirts of town, far away from white civilized society. And they could have their funeral how they saw fit away from the prying eyes of the master. And here is, of course, Horace King. And uh, buried around him are believed to be many members of the King family. And you can see his grave marks him as a Freemason, a master covered bridge builder, and an Alabama legislator. Buried on the left, there he is, and his wife, Marshall King, is buried on the right. She died in 1879. 
These two graves are typical of the black cemeteries of the Deep South. They often left very little marker, and uh, usually people would come along at a later point and either tear them down or mow over them or use it as a field for growing something. It just wasn't properly maintained over the years. And again, 420-something plus people, they haven't ground penetrated the entire thing with their uh, radar, but who knows how many people are buried here. Their names lost to history. And this is kind of typical of Confederate hospital cemeteries, right over the railroad tracks in the poorest plot of land. This would have been used for paupers or for slaves before the war, and buried here are nearly 500 people, possibly more than 500 people. There's Horace King, and uh, we just don't know how many people lie here, because the ground-penetrating radar only covered this field, and you can see hundreds and hundreds of people. Now, these would have been some of the more affluent people, the freedmen of the community, and uh, I'd be interested in learning more about them.